Well, hi, everybody, and welcome back to another great session of Ask Me Anything, presented by uh, the Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas, and I am your guest, uh, or your host today. I'm not your guest. I'm your host today. <laughs> and my guest is Jenny Jackson of developyourteam.com. And um, Jannie just has a lot of really great insight and information about what it means to incorporate trust in the workplace, what happens when there isn't any trust in the workplace, and what's the impact on you trying to create a team in the absence of that trust. So I'm personally really looking forward to this conversation. This is kind of right in my wheelhouse, some of the things that, that I love to discuss as well. So uh, let me tell you though a little bit about our forum, about the Ask Me Anything format. Uh, these are designed to be conversations. Um, they are kind of freewheeling, so we will take it where the conversation leads us but they're designed for you, the busy professional who maybe can't get to a meeting or can't get to a networking event, but you still wanna continue developing yourself personally and professionally. So we've created these forums that are online. You can listen to them at any time that's convenient for you and just keep your hand uh, in, in the in the learning and development pie and, and continue to hone your own leadership skills. So let me tell you about Jannie. Jannie Jackson is the founder of Develop Your Team, a company devoted to creating highly engaged, top performing teams. And Jannie values the uniqueness of each individual and group. So she works with each client to create a customized participant-centered program that's going to meet their specific needs. And as a successful and dynamic corporate leader for over 20 years, Jannie developed many high achieving engaged teams. She's brought her enthusiasm for people development to develop your team, where she offers innovative solutions to groups striving to achieve peak performance. So without further ado, Jannie, I'm gonna just hand the baton over to you and take it away. All right, well, thank you, Patty, and thank you for that lovely introduction and for inviting me to have this conversation with you today. So we're talking about trust, trust in the workplace, the really the ideas about trust. It's a much broader um, situation than the workplace, right? It's the principles that apply to every individual interaction or group interaction relationships, it's really the same principles that apply in the workplace. Mm -hmm. What I think about for teams and, and getting teams to perform at that high level, there are a couple of things that are really foundational. And the first one is for people to understand what the purpose is of their their organization and their team what's the mission vision and values so mm -hmm. the core the why why are we together as a team doing whatever we're doing and then the next layer of that foundation is trust and everything builds from there mm -hmm. so one of the well I have this book, The Speed of Trust, is a resource that I just love for talking about trust. Mm -hmm. what, uh, this is written by Stephen M. R. Covey, son of Stephen Covey, who wrote Seven Habits of Highly Effective. Mm -hmm. It's a great book. Yeah, yeah. So one of the, the, the core concept about trust, and this is really applicable in the workplace, is that when you have high levels of trust, then speed goes down and cost goes down. Mm -hmm. So you get things done quicker. You, I guess, speed goes up because yeah. it's faster. Speed goes up, but cost goes down. Cost right, right. In the absence of trust, things take longer and they cost more money. Mm -hmm. 
So in, you know, I, I worked in a corporate environment at one time where that the, there were low levels of trust. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, management didn't trust employees. So one of the things that really stood out to me in one of the departments, if you needed a new pen, you had to go to the lead person who would take you to the supply cabinet, unlock the door, <laughs> go inside and get a pen for you. So aside from how that makes people feel right i'm not even trusted to get a 25 cent pen for myself mm -hmm. but think about all the time that it takes for both of those people to have that interaction right right and so you know that's just to me that's a great example of how the um speed goes down and costs up because you're paying those people's salary. Right. Just to protect a pen. <laughs> you know, I worked in a company once that, um, this was probably about 25 years ago, they had gone through a complete C-level change, you know, uh, mm -hmm. with the exception of the CEO. And one of the gentlemen that came in, you know, said to me, um, I don't trust anybody. You have to earn my trust. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I would rather, start out at a place of trust. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and it's yours to lose because we get down to business a whole lot faster if if I'm not yeah. watching my back and you know investigating and and expecting the worst of you. Yeah. Yeah, great example and and one of the ways to build trust is extending trust mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, to other people. There's always that challenge with that. It's, you know, like you said, starting at a place of trust is great. And when it's, you know, you, you have to evaluate, okay, how critical is this and what are the ramifications mm -hmm. if my trust is not justified right. situation. So um, I think that's one of the issues that people have with delegation. Mm -hmm. Some, um, you know, learning how to delegate is not really so much about the actual act of delegating. It's getting over those hurdles of understanding, you know, making sure that people are ready for the task that you're going to delegate to them. And then how are you going to make sure that it happened the way that it was supposed to mm -hmm. especially you know in the beginning because over time you you build that trust because of the experiences that you have with somebody mm -hmm. looking at two aspects really for trust there's the character side which is you know those personal characteristics integrity and, and what are the other person's intentions, but then there's the competence side. Mm -hmm. That's their um, abilities and their results. Mm -hmm. And so if you bring somebody new into your organization, you want to extend as much trust to them as you can, but you also need to make sure that you're giving them all the tools that they need and the knowledge and the learning so that they can be successful. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. So what does it look like in a workplace? Um, like, you know, you gave the example of like, you can't go get a pen by yourself, yeah. but, but how else do you recognize that trust is missing in a workplace? Mm. So, you know, there's, you, you think about the way people interact with each other. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, I, I can think of a lot of examples that I've seen where that trust is missing. Mm -hmm. So it might be um, a situation where a, an employee asks their supervisor a question about how to do something or if they can do something or whatever. Um, and they get an answer 
and then they go to somebody else and ask the same question. Mm -hmm. And maybe they go to multiple people. Um, so clearly they didn't, you know, there's, there's some trust missing. Now is it the, the supervisor personally, or is it the environment? Because, um, you know, sometimes it's the systems in place create lack of trust. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things like people um, over documenting what they've done, conversations right. they've had, or those sorts of things. Um, again, time consuming, costly, if it's being done to excess. All those CYA um, type of things. Right? Exactly, CYA. Yeah. And then um, another example might be if you're in a meeting and people are very reluctant to speak up or, or voice a question or voice a concern. But then outside in the hallway after the meeting, there's all kinds of conversation about it. So, you know, something about that setting, that meeting setting, maybe somebody who's in the room or something else makes people feel like it's not safe right. to say what they need to say. Right, right. Yeah. So, you know, layers of, of bureaucracy and approval um, in the uh, insurance claims world where I've worked in the past, there's, you know, people, uh, a claims adjuster will have a certain authority level for paying claims. And if you find, um, lots of approval levels required, then maybe there's an issue with trust in that situation too. Right. So what it, do you think that trust kind of comes from the top down? Like what's the leader's role in reinforcing mm -hmm. or, or exhibiting trust? Yeah. Um, I think that the leader definitely has a huge part in it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not only the leader, um, but yeah, the leader's role is critical. So part of it is, you know, the, the leader sets the tone, creates the environment, the leader's willingness to be open and transparent and really allow people to understand what's going on and why decisions are being made. Mm -hmm. You know, all, all of that comes from the top and then the leader has that opportunity to create that, that situation for people to talk openly with each other and reward it when, when they see it, when they, that happens. Um, and also, you know, one of the, the ways that we build trust is through relationships and those, that mental, um, those, those interactions that happen over time, just a minute here and a minute there. And the leader also creates that environment where that can happen. Mm -hmm. so, you know, creating the procedures and the mindset, um, huge part of it, then the way that the leader interacts with people, you know, how, what, what are the leader's behaviors? Are they extending trust or not? Um, how does the leader talk about other people in the workplace? You know, how do they talk about their peers or their yeah, boss yeah. or their employees? Mm -hmm. Because what you know, what what people do in front of you is what they're also doing behind your back. Right. Right. Yeah, I uh, the the example I gave you earlier um, about the the executive I was talking to the complete lack of trust eradicated our ability, you know, uh, us as peer managers to work with one another because mm -hmm. everybody was so busy trying to cover their own behinds and mm -hmm. competing with one another, and it just became harder and harder to get anything done, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's, 
Exactly right. Mm -hmm. So let's imagine that, what, what would you tell somebody who says, hey, I just, <clears throat> I just inherited this team and they just seem to have no trust with one another and they certainly don't trust me. What, what would you, what advice would you give them? Mm -hmm. So first of all, if they can, I would try to get them all in the same room. Mm -hmm. Now that's not always practical anymore because we have such, you know, just geographically distributed teams, but you could do it together on Zoom, like we're doing right now too. Mm -hmm. but, but that would be the first thing is get people together in one room talking and then um, a couple of different things. Like I, you know, I really would start with nothing to do with work and just giving people the opportunity to get to know <coughs> personally mm -hmm. as we make assumptions about people and, and things and situations. Um, and until you actually, you know, have that conversation with somebody and start to get to know them as a person, and you may be having those assumptions that they're this or they're that and that you can't get along. And when you are able to get to know each other personally, mm -hmm. and a couple things happen. One is people might start caring about each other and want to do things to help each other. Um, but they also come to understand that maybe they're not so far apart mm -hmm. in, in what they want. And then as the, the leader bringing them together, um, that's a, an opportunity to really help people see that they have common goals. Mm -hmm. so a lot of times, you know, especially if it's like two groups um, coming together, they don't recognize that they have the same goals. Right. Because right. it's a different language to talk about them or, or whatever. Mm -hmm you know, find those ways where they have those commonalities and where they can agree to, to work together towards something. Um, and then with the, the leader, you know, in your example, group of people, they don't trust each other and they don't trust the leader. Then um, the more the leader can be transparent, the better. Mm -hmm. I know many times in workplace environments the leader you know they they can't tell everything mm -hmm. things that are happening either you know business wise that are being planned or discussed or thought about or um cash flow issues you know they can't talk about everything mm -hmm. but figure out what are the things that you can share and let people know i'm I'm going to tell you everything that I can. Mm -hmm. If there's something I can't answer or that, you know, I can't give you that information, I will do my best to tell you why. Right. So over, <laughs> in, on the one hand, building that trust takes time because it's those, those interactions over and over and over again where people, you know, where what you say matches what you do and people see that and they grow to trust you more and more and more right you also can be intentional about creating trust and that's where things like team building come into play so how do you um you know take you take this group of people and have them participate in a series of activities designed to accelerate that trust building mm -hmm. or whatever it else it is that they need to be working on um, because in those types of uh, experiential learning activities you're surfacing behaviors that happen every day mm -hmm. but now you can do it in a controlled environment where it can come to the surface, people can see it, people can talk about it in a safe way. Right, right. 
you know, um, I couldn't agree with you more about the part the, the relationship part, you know, of mm-hmm. things because, you know, my mom was a, an expert seamstress. And I remember from the time I was a little kid, she would say something like lace covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> what she meant was if she made a mistake, she would just put rickrack on it, you know, or something uh-huh. to cover it up. And as I got older, I thought, especially in business, that relationship covers a multitude of sins, you know, that mm-hmm. we're more likely to be forgiving of one another. We're more likely to give each other the benefit of the doubt when we've established some sort of a relationship with each yeah. other. You know, it's much easier to ascribe bad intentions, you know, to somebody that you don't have a relationship with. Yeah. And that just breaks trust, you know, apart like crazy. So, you know, I was glad that you said the first thing is some sort of relationship development, you know, with each person individually and then the group collectively mm-hmm. um, is going to go a long way to even having people want to develop trust, you know, with them. Right. Sort of- yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they get in such a habit of not trusting mm-hmm. that, um, you know, they might not even think that it's possible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a friend of mine told me many years ago, we actually, so we, we worked on a team together where there were trust issues mm-hmm. in, a, in a lot of places, mm-hmm. um, not everywhere. Um, but one of the, the the phrases that really stuck with me that he used was assume best intent. Yeah. And if you approach every interaction with somebody and you assume that their intentions are good, you can see things a whole different way. It's a, yeah. it's a whole different experience than assuming the worst. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, you know, I've been in... Um, environments that are, you know, all the way from the the one I described, you know, that's way over here, which the sad thing was, was that that wasn't the way it used to be. That Mm. was the tone that was ushered in by these new executives. And, and it was a very odd thing because it actually came from two of them, the COO and the CTO, who did not trust each other at all and Mm -hmm. were in competition with each other. And that just flowed you know, downward. Yeah. Yeah. Other organizations where the trust level was super, super high, you know, where yeah. you would almost have to do something incredibly egregious, you know, <laughs> to lose the trust of your coworker or your yeah. so so and how so those other organizations that you experienced, what what do you think was the reason for that? That people trusted each other? Part of it was um, the environment of the company itself. It was uh, an older company had been started by some family members. Mm -hmm. Um, And so in the early days, they had kind of treated everybody like family. And and Mm -hmm. even as the company grew and morphed into something else, that feeling, that culture still persisted. You know? Yeah, yeah. So I think that again, we're kind of talking about it coming from the top and going down. Mm-hmm. So, having said that, how likely is it that if if you do have a distrustful type workplace, a distrustful culture, how likely is it that a manager or a, a leader can reinforce trust within a small microcosm of the mm-hmm. company? Oh, I, I think it's definitely possible. I've, I've experienced it mm-hmm. myself. Um, but it really is, I, you know, I think being intentional about it is really important. Mm-hmm. Um, experience that I had like that, where in general there was, I would say there was one manager in particular that kind of generated the distrust, Mm -hmm. but then groups that worked below that person um, 
You know, one of the things that that we did, I was part of this group where we recognized that every time we were out in the, the break room or the lunch room, everybody gossiped, you know, they gossiped about that person who just left the room or the person sitting over there and this person gained weight and this person did this. And, and one day, three of us decided, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to gossip. Mm -hmm. And just making that one decision and then the three of us holding each other accountable, that created this environment in this area where we worked of this huge amount of trust mm. just by not gossiping. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Because, you know, really if you hear people gossiping about somebody else, it's just natural that you think, you know, the minute I leave the room, you're, you're going to be talking about me too. Right. Right. And, and how do you trust? <laughs> You know? right. how, how do I trust any conversation I have with that person? Right. right. So I, I know recently I was talking with a friend and, and she said, she goes, I'm going to tell you a secret, but you can't tell anybody. <laughs> and my first, that actually was, okay, have I ever told anybody something that I wasn't, you know, that you told me? Right. <laughs> Why do you have to set it up that way? <laughs> yeah, except that, that, you know, but it also kind of makes sense too, because sometimes you have information that's not a secret and it's okay to share. Maybe it should be shared. Mm -hmm. And so being explicit about this, you know, this is to share, this is not to share. Right. Can help create that environment too, where people, to expect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how does, how does trust and delegation tie in? Mm. Like what's the connection between those two things? Mm -hmm. So a couple of things. First of all, we, we touched on it a little bit earlier in that um, if, if I'm going to delegate something to somebody, I need to be able to trust that they can do it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the challenge that, that leaders run into is that oftentimes there's way too much on the plate mm -hmm. and not enough hours in the day and all of that. So we need to delegate to people and the, you know, we're still the ones ultimately responsible. Right. So if I delegate something, it's, it's my reputation on the line. And so you know, that, that challenge of extending trust comes into play here because can, you know, figuring out, okay, what is it that I'm worried about? <laughs> I knew my phone would ring while we were talking. <laughs> um, what's my concern in delegating to this person? Is it, um, you know, am I worried about their character, their integrity? Mm -hmm. Now that's a whole separate thing than is it their ability to complete this task? Right. And so what do I have to do to make sure, ensure that this person has the knowledge that they need and also the support mm -hmm. from me? So, you know, I, if, if I'm going to delegate a big task, then we probably need to have check-in points because I need to be assured that I, you know, it's not going to be the day before it's due and I find out nothing's done. Right. So there's that balance between extending trust and also having that assurance that it's going to be done to the standard it needs to be done. Right. Right. Um, there's it also kind of goes to you establishing trust with that person that you're delegating to as well. There's nothing worse than, than delegating and dumping, you know, and, right. and having that person be like, well, I, I don't even know what to do, you know? So you're, you're kind of creating that two way trust of, wow, this is really awesome that I'm being entrusted with this, this thing to do and also supported in doing it. Right. 
Right. Yeah, because for me, it's an ethical issue if I am dumping stuff on somebody because it's, you know, something I I don't want to do, maybe, you know, it's just like, it's okay to delegate something you don't like to do, but... <clears throat> You just, yeah, you have to think about it. Is it really, you know, am I giving this to the best person to handle it? Or um, is this something that can help that person with their development? Yeah. You know, something challenging, but not so challenging. And, and yeah, making sure that I, it's okay to take it off of my plate, but not to the extent that it, overburdens somebody else right all right yeah yeah that's one of the um, when i talk to managers about delegating you know especially um i teach a class for people who are new managers you know and so mm -hmm. they they've gone from being a line employee to now being a new manager and there's a a whole segment of the of the curriculum that talks about you're not a line employee anymore you know you have yeah. to learn how to delegate some things and one of the first things I'll hear is oh but everybody's got so much to do already you know I can't dump something else on them this well first of all get rid of the word dump that's not <laughs> it this is sharing responsibility this is mm -hmm. interesting. this is giving them development opportunities you know provided right. your intent is in the in the right place but yeah it's a yeah. great opportunity yeah, yeah, it's it's figuring out who who's the right person mm -hmm. to actually be doing this task. Yeah. So if you're the new manager and you used to do that job just because you have the ability to do it, is that the right task for you to be doing? Right. Because now you have a new role, mm -hmm. um, you need to be doing other things. I think. The other thing um, about delegation that you know kind of becomes related is micromanagement. Mm. So <laughs> there's you know how how do you you know back to that um, having the checks and balances, but making sure that you give the person room to do what you've assigned them to do or ask them to do instead of um, being, you know, following every step and being involved to too great of a detail because that takes away trust. Right. If, if somebody's looking over my shoulder for, at everything that I'm doing, then clearly I don't feel trusted. Mm -hmm. And then that makes me not trust the other person right. as, as much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal, right? You know, trust in the workplace is, is really a big deal. Uh, oh, yeah. I say to a, a manager who says, you know, this is my job, you know, to get the work done, to direct people in what to do. I don't have time for all that touchy-feely, trusty stuff, you know? Uh -huh. What do you That's say? What? what do you say to that person? <laughs> um, so... I guess what I, what I say to that is that the touchy feely fluffy stuff mm -hmm. is that first of all, right. um, but it's also, it's an investment. Mm -hmm. So you invest that time on the front end to allow people to build relationships, to get to know each other, to understand what that common purpose is and, do things intentionally to build trust. When you make that investment on the front end, then you get the payoff forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this is where, again, going back to the book, The Speed of Trust, where you know they, he's giving concrete examples of financial changes based on lack of trust or or a trusting environment. Um, but when, when you recognize that things get done quicker 
and things go more smoothly, that's, that's money. Right. You know, that's, there's value in that. And so um, an example would be meetings because so many times people, you know, the, the idea about meetings is that it's just, it's a waste of time and mm -hmm. why do we even have to do it? And often it's a waste of time because there's a lack of trust. And so things don't happen in the meeting that are supposed to happen. Therefore, you have to have another meeting and another right. meeting, another meeting. Right. And so that's the conversation about why it's, it's not just fluff. It may seem like it, that relationship side, but, um, but when you think about the time and the, the money that you save going forward, um, it's a good investment. Yeah. It's a bottom, there's a bottom line impact, you know, to that. Yeah, when definitely. You're constantly checking up on one another and having meetings to correct things that didn't happen in the meeting or you're having the meetings after the meetings, you know, because mm -hmm. people won't speak up. That, that's just, yeah. uh, that's a waste of resources and a waste of time and a, a sure yeah. bet to make sure that you have to do everything more than once. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 One of the environments that I worked in, um, we worked so it was a 24 hour operation, a data processing group. And so, and there was, you know, a, a person on the day shift, a person on the swing shift, a person on the graveyard shift. And that group turned out to be one of the most trusting groups that I've ever worked with. Hmm. Though they had very limited face to face time. We had a monthly meeting where we managed to all get together for an hour, even with all those crazy shifts. But other than that, it, they maybe, you know, people saw each other for 15 minutes here and there. Um, but they, the trust was built by people looking out for each other. Mm -hmm. So for example, at the, the end of one shift, the, that person would look for everything that they could do to get things set up for, on the next shift. Yeah. And that was the culture. Mm -hmm. When you came in at 5 p.m. for your evening shift, you had your magnetic tapes ready to go, you had your labels, you had your forms that needed to be printed. Everything that could be done to be ready for you was done. And everybody did that on every shift for the next mm -hmm. one. And just those, those little things established this, this sense of caring and trust and this understanding that, you know, if, if now if I come in from my 5 p.m. shift and none of that stuff's done, I know it's because that person couldn't get to it. Right. Right, right. Things happened on the earlier shifts and they, they couldn't do it. Um, and that particular group hasn't worked together since the beginning of 2001 and still gets together at least once a year for dinner. Oh, that's neat. And it's just, it's, <clears throat> they're so tight. It's so much fun to see. Right. And conversely, you know, it, it the opposite would happen. If they didn't bother to try to do those setup things for each other, then that next shift wouldn't do it for the next shift. And so it right. just, you know, replicates itself again. Yeah. 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 You know, what's yeah. funny, I, um, a few years ago, I took a job, a part-time job working in a winery because I love wine mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. thought it would be fun to learn the business, you know, and be able to, to lead testing or tastings and tours and things like that. And I loved that part of the job. You know, it was something yeah. I really looked forward to doing, but the, the management was so incredibly distrustful of everybody that mm. it, they took all the joy out of the job. I only mm -hmm. lasted there three months 
And I was like, this is a part-time job and I was doing this for fun. I don't need to be abused. <laughs> you know, like this. Yeah, yeah. There were other people there that, you know, that needed the job. And, but there was such a, a revolving door there. I mean, nobody could stay. Hmm. The environment was so, so distrustful. They had, kids, yeah. you know, um, around watching what you were doing when you weren't in the tasting room. Mm -hmm. Like, seriously? Um, everything you did, you had to write down. Well, what, what's the point of writing it down? You just did it. So now you have to spend the time writing it down. Right. It was just a, it was, it was very unpleasant and very shocking to me that in, in a very small environment, what should have been a lot of camaraderie and a lot of fun, mm -hmm. was completely ruined by, you know, by this person's lack of trust. And then we found out she even had cameras at her house. Oh, so wow. That she could watch what her husband did if he was home and she wasn't. <laughs> this was a person with some big trust issues. Yeah, yeah. I know. Sometimes, you know, I wonder how people get to be that way. You know, what happened in their life that would, would create that. Right. But, you know, so your example makes me think about, you know, something I notice at different businesses that I interact with. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a Mexican restaurant that I used to go to for years and years. And one of the things that I really loved about that place was the way the staff, the way people interacted with each other. Mm -hmm. It's, it spills over to the customer experience. Mm -hmm. For example, um, there you know, was this very high level of trust. So you have your server at your table who's taking care of you, but any other server would come by and also help you. Mm -hmm. You know, there was that sense of, oh, that's my table, you know, and I'm, I'm, who knows how they handle tips and that sort of thing, but one day, remember being there where um, somebody had dropped a whole platter of food yeah and that it was cleaned up with like I don't know two or three minutes mm -hmm. because everybody came instantly cleaned everything up did it with a smile laughter singing new food <laughs> you know, it just yeah. because this environment of trust and fun and camaraderie was created and encouraged and as a result things got done more quickly yeah. customers had a great experience because the people who were taking care of them were having a good time then you have a good time yeah well you said something interesting about um you know you don't know how the tips were handled there so right. I, I look at like sales teams and mm -hmm. um, and restaurant you know anything where it's set up where you're in competition with one another yeah um it seems like competition and trust would have a difficult time coexisting mm -hmm. have you seen an environment where where somehow they they did trust one another even though they were in competition with one another yes you know, so it gets challenging, like, um, you know, when it comes to annual review time mm. and people get their, you know, their, their review and their rating. And, you know, that has its place. Um, the challenge comes in when people are also ranked. Mm -hmm. You start ranking people top to bottom and people's raises are impacted by where they fall. That, I, I understand reasons for that also, but that's an, a big challenge right. for us because, you know, somehow it's, okay, if I collaborate with this other person and I help them, are they going to come out higher than me? Mm -hmm. right. yeah. 
So that can be very difficult. I've still seen teams that are able to work together effectively in that kind of environment. Um, but you know, people have to understand, and as a leader, you have to help get them to that place where they understand that together they're able to accomplish more. Yeah. And in the end, even though there's going to be this ranking one through whatever, by working together, maybe they're going to be two and three, you know, instead of three and. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah or exactly. Whatever. Um, but then I've also noticed other environments where, because my background was working in a corporate environment with that sort of structure where you had your, your rating and ranking. Then when I've gotten involved with other groups like the whole experiential education community, that, you know, that's, that's not a, an organization like a company. So you don't have ratings and rankings. <clears throat> People who are involved in experiential education and, you know, have a, a conference every year where people go and they share all their great ideas about their work and the things that they're doing. And it, it's amazing. First of all, it works really well because everybody gets better. Mm -hmm. um, but it was hard for me to get used to and hard for me, you know, to trust that I could share my great ideas and people weren't going to steal them. Steal them, yeah. But it's, it's really more of a mindset that there's enough for all of us. Mm -hmm. And if I share my ideas, other people will share their ideas and we can build better things together. Yeah. They can use my ideas, I can use theirs. And it's, yeah, it's a great experience actually to go to an experiential education. Yeah. But you know, even, even in a corporate setting that can exist, you know, that, mm -hmm. that I, you know, getting rid of that feeling of scarcity that there's only so much and I've right. got to hold on to mine. You know, if if we're willing to share ideas and and not be afraid somebody's going to steal it from us, um, then everybody is is better. You know, I I, I don't like um, you know common sayings, but that one about team. You know, together everyone achieves more is uh -huh. really good. It's it's a really true statement. Yes, together we're better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of my favorite quotations was, so I'm a, I'm a hockey fan and a LA Kings fan, and it took them a really long time to win a championship. Mm -hmm. And when they finally did, Luke Robitaille, who was part of the management, so one of the things he said was, an individual can win a game, but a team wins a championship. Yeah, yeah, and that that's just a really quote. stuck with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great quote. Yeah, and <laughs> you know, any it's it's more visible in sports. You can because you know people are playing. You know, you're a spectator. You're watching it. The goal is really clear. Mm -hmm. You know what they're trying to do, but I see it all the time where a team can be really successful even though they don't have star players mm -hmm. it's something about the way they all come together they have to trust each other you, i'm also a football fan and you see it with football all the time right yeah. and the quarterback throws that pass and they throw it before the receiver has even turned on their route to mm -hmm. get the spot where the ball is going to be but the quarterback trusts because yeah. they They've built that over time. And they've worked together, they've practiced, and now the quarterback trusts that somebody's going to be there to catch the ball mm -hmm. where it's supposed to be. Right, right. Well, Janny, this has been a really great conversation. I've really enjoyed the time that we've spent together. Do you have any last thoughts, any last um, tips or tidbits that you want to leave the audience with? 
Mm. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I would say um, <clears throat> it's really important to think about our behaviors mm -hmm. and our, you know, if, if I want to build trust or be seen as a trustworthy person, what what are my behaviors telling the world? Because you know, back to the example that I gave you earlier about the friend saying, I'm gonna tell you a secret you can't tell anybody. Um, I can tell her, you know, I, I can say all day long, oh, don't worry, I won't tell anybody. But if she ever has the experience with me where I do, mm -hmm. that's, that's what people believe. Yes we do, what they see, what our, how we act and behave, that's what's gonna generate trust or destroy it. Right. And sometimes you know, it's incremental. It can be the little things that happen over time. It, it can take a long time for your, to build trust through your actions, but then you can destroy trust yeah. in moments. Yes. Yeah. And then trying to build it back from there is, is a long, long, hard road. Yeah. 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 Well, Jannie, tell us how people can get a hold of you. Where can they reach you? Okay. So they can email me at Jannie at developyourteam.com. So it's J A N I at developyourteam, all one word.com. Or they could call me at 760-585-8492. Um, my website is developyourteam.com and all good ways to get a hold of me. Great. Well, this has been so good. I've really enjoyed it. Like I said, I can talk about teams and team development and team <laughs> interactions all day long. So thank you so much for spending so much of your valuable time with us and sharing that with, with the rest of our listeners here. And for the rest of you, uh, just keep watching our Facebook page, keep watching our uh, connectedwomenofinfluence.com website for more of these upcoming leadership forums and online forums. And we look forward to seeing you again very soon in the new year. Take care. Thanks again, Janet. All right. Thanks so much, Patty.